button. All right, freaks and freakettes, welcome to a super crazy, fantastical episode of Student of the Gun Radio. We got lots of stuff for you guys today. Today, we uh, we do we dip back into the archives. We're going to let you guys listen to an interview that we did several years ago um, with uh, Steve Lauer. Uh, Steve recently passed of Duracoat. So uh, we thought now would be a great time to, I'm, and I'm glad that we did it. I'm very glad that we took yes, the time to do that. For sure. So we're going to listen to the words of, of the immortal Steve Lauer. And uh, then we have a guest. We've got Scott Hambrick from Online Great Books. And we're going to talk about his apocalypse book. Um, I had a little crack there. Apocalypse book list, reading list. Uh, you, you know, you just said I have a little crack there, and it reminded me that I was walking by Ruth the other day, and she goes, <laughs> Daddy, you have a butt crack and a butt. I was like, uh, thank you. Thanks, baby. Thanks, Where did baby. that come from? You have a butt crack. <laughs> just like yes. her daddy. Yes. When did, uh, yeah. did she say whether or not it made sense to her? Yeah, I did. She, is it the same, any sense to have a crack in your butt? It makes no sense to have a hole in your butt. Uh, I've been injured. <laughs> I have a crack in my butt. But anyway, um, enough third grade humor. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and move on to, uh, well, thanking and acknowledging uh, everyone after, 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 the, after the music. After the music. After the music. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, proudly brought to you from the SDS Import Studio. If you want quality that's affordable, visit sdsimports.com. We don't just talk guns and gear. We also discuss current events and politics because guns are politics. Now sit back and listen louder to your co-host, CEO of Full 30, Jared Markle, and your beloved host, the pimp hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. Yes, indeed he do. Yes, indeed he do. Now wait. When we uh, when we have these interviews where we bring people in, we don't do it uh, a lot. We don't do it often because it want, we want it to be special. We want it to be special. And it is very special. So when we have these interviews, often we put aside, we set aside the the norm, uh, you know, the normal format. So I get to do things like this. I need to thank our friends at Duracoat. Uh, and we're going to have Scott, I'm um, sorry, not Scott, Steve, Steve Lauer's interview. And of course, our friends at Brownells, Brownells.com. They just, oh, I got my cans in. <gasps> did you? Yeah. You ordered some? I sure did. I oh, told you I ordered. Well, I guess them. I'm going to keep the ones that I ordered for you. How, how many did you order? I I'll ordered take 10 them. total. Oh, so okay, good. Five for you, five for you. need some, Zach? Yeah. What? Okay. What kind of question need... is that? Of course I do. Well, uh, dang, did I'm you, not going to have any left for myself. Did you get yours in? Yes, I got the box yesterday. Okay, I got the box yesterday too. So they're they're not a full size. They're like a two third size. Oh, I didn't look uh, at them yet. Oh, you didn't open them yet? But oh, they'll yeah. hold ammo, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 yeah um, one of the one of the things that one of the conundrums <gasps> that I came up with is is I they're still on sale. Are they really? Yeah, wow. forty five caliber ammo can. As I don't I, know. I don't know why why that is but they're like less than half of the normal price if you got and here's the deal guys you're like oh they're just plastic what is plastic made out of petroleum right you un what we need to understand is everything that arrives at a store via truck is going to go up in price everything that's manufactured out of polymer or petroleum, petroleum is polymer, polymer, petroleum, is going to go up. Everything is going to become more expensive. Now, steel might not, but yeah, it probably will, because all, all of the you know base metals, steel, copper, they're all going up. Um, so now is the time. Uh, I have a hard time going to a store and dropping... 13 14 bucks on a plastic ammo can i just do yeah but for five bucks yeah uh what i've been doing is when when i go to the to in to get supplies is i'll go to the evil empire and uh, see if they have the evil empire is pretty much worthless for gun things now but they do still stock 
100 shot packs of bird shot, 12 gauge trap and, and field load, right? Uh, and they're not cheap. I remember when they were twenty one ninety nine for a hundred, and they're not anymore. They're like twenty nine ninety nine for a hundred, but it just does, like I said, doesn't matter. Uh, it's if it's there, it's there. If it's not there, then you can't have it. So what I've been doing for well all summer long, actually, or winter long, or what what time is it? I don't know. Um, if I would go into the Evil Empire, and I don't go there very often, but if they had a hundred pack of shotgun training ammo, you know, birdshot. I buy it. And then I found I didn't have enough cans to put it in. So it was just sitting in boxes on the shelf. And I was like, yeah, that's not. Uh. So that's a, I, I, I figured, I found that you could put four boxes of 12 gauge into one of those ammo cans. I think four, four or four and a half boxes into one of those ammo cans of box of 25, you know, bird shot what have you oh that's good so training ammo yeah so that's what i'm putting in, in mind is is the shotgun ammo uh i wouldn't i tell you what you want you want to know what's heavy a 50 caliber ammo can with no trays no boxes just ammunition in 45 acp oh yeah i picked it up what I did yesterday or the last couple of days or whatever is I, I've had all these miscellaneous boxes of, you know, ammo and I got rid of all the trays and I filled a can with 45 ACP and I swear it's as heavy as a 45 pound plate. Oh, geez. I think it's I think it might be heavier because when I pick up a 45 pound plate and then I pick up that can, I'm like, this can is heavier. It feels heavier. Um. I'm, I, you know where I learned that? I learned that from Super Dave when I was roommates with Super Dave Harrington. Oh, yeah. And he's like, grab that ammo can for me. So I walk over <laughs> and I'm like, I grab it like, <laughs> that was before you started barbell training. It, it was it was literally filled with with ball, 230 grain ball ammo to the to the top. No boxes, no trays. Because, you know, when you get rid of the styrofoam or the plastic trays and the boxes and just put bullets in it, you're like, wow. You can fit, for those of you that are curious, you can fit 2,000 rounds of 9mm in a 50 caliber ammo can. And I think you can fit 1,500 or 1,400, 45 ACP. Um, remember when we did the ammo can challenge? Yeah. Yeah. We were so far ahead of our game. Yeah. With the ammo can challenge and the and the uh, the tote Rubbermaid tote challenge and all that stuff. We're, yep. See, you uh, know what we haven't done what we haven't done a holster challenge yet, have we? What filling up your a box full of holsters? Yeah, filling up a holster with a box full of guns. Yeah, I already did that. I was I, just I, thinking of. I have a Rubbermaid tote use, full of holsters. Did, yeah, did we do like the arc bag challenge or something? I can't remember what we did with crossbreed but i thought we did at some sort of i don't think it was a challenge but i think it was like go get an arc bag yeah i mean we did the arc bag and i said this is what you should put in it uh, okay. arc, i put the Actually, fundamental four into an arc bag yeah and i i think part of it might have been you telling people to do that and then telling them set an alarm for six months or a year from now or a reminder or whatever and then go see and look and see how it is not rusted yeah I so those of you part that of it ordered an arc bag from crossbreedholsters.com and did that. I don't think we ever checked in on you. Go check them. Right now is your beep, 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 beep. Check. That's the alarm. Go yep. check your bag, your arc bag with your gun in it or your fundamental four and see what's going on in that sucker. Yeah. It should look brand new. All right. Uh, let's, without further ado, let's listen to the Steve Lauer Duracoat interview. Now, we've got a treat for you guys. Uh, a gentleman is hanging out on the line. He's waiting for me to introduce him. He is the the founder, CEO, the brains behind Duracoat. Now, I didn't, I, if you'd have told me five years ago that there would be uh, a color wars going on. It's funny, we use the term color wars, and people are like, you're a racist. <laughs> you're a racist. Why are you fostering racism in America? No, the other kind of color, like like purple and red and blue and so forth. Uh, 
But, uh, yeah, and we wanted to address this. I mean, obviously, Duracoat is a sponsor of ours. They're friends of ours. We've known the Lauer family for a long time uh, and personally acquainted with them. And we've known, we knew them long before they became sponsors of Student of the Gun. But they are on board with us because they get it. What have we been telling you? That there are certain people in the firearms industries that, that get it and some that are just trying to sell you blenders. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the man, and, and we're going to talk, and you're just going to listen, and that's the way it's going to be. Steve, how you doing today? I'm doing good, Paul. How about you? Oh, just Jim Dandy. Yeah, Jim Dandy. Remember yeah, that. it's just a beautiful day here in northern Wisconsin. Uh, I'm standing here in my shop. We've got a couple of doors open. I'm looking outside. we got we got beautiful sun, a nice 68 degrees, no wind. I mean, it's just great. This is God's country. The, the critters moving around up there. I'm sure you got plenty of. Critters. Oh yeah, when it gets to be this time of year, boy, the critters are running. We got the deer running around. We got the raccoons. The whole deal's going on. Do you have black bear where you are? Oh, you bet. We got black bear. Probably more than we should. Don't don't leave the uh, the kitchen door open. They'll come in and eat your ice cream. Well, well yeah, I, I left. Uh, you know, and I know better. And I left the door on my uh, the back door of my uh, pickup truck open. And I walked away from it for half an hour, and when I got back, everything was thrown out on the ground. <laughs> a, bear? a bear? Yeah, you just can't do that. you got to close the door. <laughs> Otherwise, those guys will find it, and they'll throw it around. Uh, you know, I heard if you, if you put bullets into them, they make great rugs. <laughs> but that's what, that's what I was told. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my allergies are bothering me a little bit today. I'm oh. stuffed up and whatever, but uh, yes. other than that, it's going good. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty excited because I'm heading down to Knob Creek here. As soon as I get done talking to you, gentlemen, I'm heading for the airport. I'm going down to the Knob Creek machine gun shoot, which I do every October mm-hmm. and April. I've been doing that for the last 25 years, I want to say. So we've got to make it to one of those. Yeah, we know our buddy Zach's going up there this weekend, yeah. and Walt Keller. Yeah. Uh, and you, yeah, last yeah. last weekend we had the first ever in Wisconsin uh, NRA ILA Defend America shoot um, at a range just up the road here from us, and uh, we brought out some good NRA supporters, and I brought in my transferable machine guns and suppress guns and a bunch of ammo and stuff, and we just shot up the day. That's cool. That's living like a free man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. And now, Steve, are you down with me that life is too short to have an ugly gun? Would you say that's true? Yes. Will, will you go on record right now as saying life is too short <laughs> to have an ugly gun? Yes. All right. I'm you, on you, record. Folks, you heard it. Steve Lauer went on record. Uh, life is too short to have an ugly gun. Now, t- uh, we're going to talk ugly guns. We're going to talk about colors. We're going to talk about lots of stuff. But... Let's just take, let's spend maybe five minutes. I don't want to spend the whole show on this. I don't really want to beat the dead horse. But a lot of folks out there in the audience, uh, they came across this story because, let's face it, a lot of people that listen to me, they, they follow the firearms blogs, they follow the, the message boards, they, you know, all that jazz. And, and they're like, oh, did you guys hear about this this Duracoat versus Saracoat thing? And, and it's it's like a religion. We, we know that. You know, if somebody is a Winchester guy or a Mossberg guy or a Remington guy and you insult that, it's like you insulted his religion. And somebody who has Cerakote finish on their guns and they see something that doesn't present them in their life, they immediately get their, their back hairs up and they're like, who, who the heck are you? And I think I, I've been in, you, in this business long enough to know that there have been situations where companies – Mm, borrowed from other companies, shall we say, uh, reverse engineered other companies' triggers, uh, things like that. And when the company in question comes out to defend their intellectual property, there's this weird almost junior high reaction that the person who's defending their trademark, the person who's defending their, their intellectual property, that they're now they're they're now a crybaby or they're now a you know sometimes sour grapes or or what have you and we tried to explain in the article and i did last week on the radio about how a manufacturer and a trademark holder you know they really have no choice but to defend their patents and trademarks am i correct there well that's why we get it done i mean that's why we have patents and trademarks you know and uh i would never ever infringe on somebody else's okay and and what happened with us is uh i was just sitting there on uh, with my with my wife on uh, on the patio 
talking about life and whatever up at our lake place. And all of a sudden I said to her, did you see our new website? And she goes, no, I didn't. And so she walks in the house and goes on her laptop, and all of a sudden she comes to the door and she says, Steve, you got to come in here and see this. <laughs> well, when you look up Duracode or Lower Custom Weaponry on, on Google, it takes you to Saracote's website. And, I mean, I never really paid much attention to these people. They're pretty small in my world. And and so uh, I got to looking at their website and, oh, you know, false testing, all sorts of stuff. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, and I thought that people, you know, I've always thought that people in the firearm industry should stick together to work together and whatever, but apparently that's not happening. So you Google search the word Duracoat, and the and the the pop up ad, you know, was, was it like buy? Yeah, Dura- right on the right on the top of Google, it says, you know, something like uh, where to buy Duracoat, and you click on it, and it goes to Saracote's website. So obviously, they can't even sell that product wow. without our name. Wow, that's that's crazy. If you're like, so that using people are like, oh, that's pretty slick, you know, that they're like, well, it's slick until you get to the point where. Duracoat is a trademark name. It's not like buy, right. It's a registered trademark. It's not like buygunfinish dot com or something. Right. You know, if you said you know gunfinish dot com or refinish your guns or something, okay, that's open for everybody to use. But it's imagine you know buy Coca Cola here and it takes you to the uh, the PepsiCo distributorship. Right. right. You know, Coca Cola would definitely have a problem with that. I would uh, think so. Yeah. You know, I would think so. But actually, you know, I'm I'm kind of flattered by it too. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you really you need your you you need my name to sell your stuff. That's great. I love it. Yeah. Oh, for oh, as I'm sorry, as a point of clarity, Jared, do you want to make a point of clarity? You're like, well, oh, that's what your guts got one guy's side yeah. of the. I would say I we opened up the invitation to a representative from Saracote. Uh, they refused the interview, so they, yeah, they, we, him and we were going to have him and Steve come on and basically present the facts to you guys because we could. It would be great to have the two different sides with the moderator in the middle. Uh, and, but and, they they declined our invitation. Yeah. They respectfully declined the invitation to so join us. Today, I, I told so. him that if he wanted to present his side, then he can do it via email because um, he couldn't join us today. So maybe he will, maybe he won't. We'll yeah. see. So there you go. Uh, well, and, and I, I'm guessing, or well, there there has been litigation, and there's litigation in the process. Is that correct, Steve? Yes. And I wouldn't. I, and I'm sure that your attorney said that litigation in process cannot be discussed. Right. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Uh, no big deal. You know, it, are you familiar with the guys with the folks at Crossbreed Holsters, Steve? Do you, you know them personally? No, I don't know them personally. No. Well, well they had a, a very similar, well, not an exact similar situation, but you know, Crossbreed, the company's ten years old now, and for the last five years or so, people have been ripping off that design like it was like it was fun, like it was you know going on a style. And then last year, they were granted the patents, like several patents for the Super Tuck holster. And so their attorneys advised them, like, okay, well, in order to protect this patent, you need to defend it. You can't just say, oh, we have a patent. Right. In order to maintain a patent, you have to defend that patent actively. Because right. otherwise, they're going to yep. say, well, you don't seem to care. You're not defending it. Well, you know, Crossbreed sent out basically attorney-generated letters that said, oh, P.S., your product, the one that you're making, is an exact total ripoff of our patented product, and you need to stop doing it. Well, all these these uh, these junior high minded people on you know in the gun culture are like oh crossbreeds a bunch of crybabies because they're, they're, they're like no it's called defending your intellectual property, uh, right? And it just dumbfounds me. And that's just one example that, that I have. There have been others over the years, and and you know, there's there's some companies that that flat out make their business like redesigning other people's stuff. And that's it's right. sad. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, but, but that's just the you know the world. Well, they're not innovative in. companies. You always you know you're not going to see any real innovation from these people. It's the stick in your finger it's a, it's in the a air. Knock off. What what's popular today, and how can I can I right. you know, reproduce right. that thing that's popular? And in the end, those companies don't last anyway. But let's talk about something that's innovative. And brother, you told me about this. Actually, it was like two or oh, I think it was NRA in Houston. And matter of fact, it was. I was. I came into your booth, and we were talking. And I said, you know, I really want to um, do some at home projects. And I was talking about you, the shake and bake package. And you said, "Ooh, stop! There's something that's coming that is going to make the shake and bake seem like child's play." Uh, 
it's you're going to be able to do it in your garage in your shop with one can and for those at home that that for some strange crazy reason are not hip to the can and can technology can you kind of tell them what that's all about it's unbelievable i mean when we first introduced duracoat back in 2000 2001 somewhere in there um everybody wanted an aerosol we thought it was a great product but they wanted an aerosol you know, and how do you do that? It's a two-part product. It's got to be mixed together. I mean, you can't stick it in an aerosol like that. It's going to it's gonna set up before it gets to your house, you know. So we worked on it for years. We, we created the Dura, the DuraBake product, you know, which, which uh, has a catalyst that doesn't kick in until 350 degrees. So that could be put in an aerosol, and that's an extremely popular product. Um, but all of a sudden, one day here a couple years ago, we found uh, a manufacturer of, of aerosol cans in Germany that have a two-part can. A can that, there's a, it's a can within a can technology. So our hardener can go into the inner can, uh, the Duracone and the propellant goes in the outer can, and you just press a little button, shake it up, and boom, you're ready to go. Unbelievable. I mean, uh, uh, the aerosol business here has exploded. And then we came along with our new Dura, DuraBlue product, and that also goes in the aerosol. I mean, I, I can't believe it. I mean, almost every order that goes out of here in a day has some type of an aerosol in it. So, well, we're yeah, happy. you know, people have figured it out. And and you know, when you and I talked about it, and I said, brother, there are mi- a million gun owners out there that have a shotgun, a rifle, a something that looks like crap. They know it looks like crap. And they may have shopped around. They may have asked a guy, that, or they went to the local guy, and he's they're like, "Hey, man, you know, my grandpa's shotgun. You know, he gave me a Winchester, or whatever, and it's seen better days. Can you reblue that?" And the guy's like, "Sure." And this is the price tag, and he's like, "Oh, man, I can't, I can't put two hundred dollars into a rebluing job on a gun that's worth two hundred dollars. I just can't justify it, you know." Right. Uh, so how many of those guys you say, well, what if I told you, it's one of those, what if I told you that you could refinish that gun in your own garage without, without shipping it to, you know, there are a lot of guys across the country that do fantastic work, but you have to send the gun to them. And in today's world, that is a huge pain in the butt. And, and most guys, rather than, than go through that pain in the butt, will just not do it. Right. Yeah, they just they just won't. Um, yeah. So so the the DuraBlue we've got it in in an aerosol. We've got it in a in a liquid form. You can use your own spray gun or whatever on it, and you cannot tell the difference from an actual high polish blue. And we now have matte finish also, and we're just about ready to re- release Niter Blue. So. It's expanding, so we're going to have several more, and we're also, by SHOT Show, we're going to have uh, spray-on uh, parkerizing replacement in several colors, gray, dark gray, black, green, you know, the green from World War II, yeah. like on the M1 carbines, that's coming to SHOT also. Oh, well, we, we, you and I had that conversation about the uh, the the military OD green and how they have that the can that's essentially uh, uh, an right. ex- exact yeah. repl- is that what we're, you're talking about is that the that's the, what we're talking about oh ah, see how we have these conversations and then like a couple months later this is folks this is how, what happens Steve and I have a conversation <laughs> and, and then three months later it's like oh we're ready to go for that on that <laughs> yeah. we're about getting it done we have uh we have more new products each year at SHOT Show than, than the alleged competition companies have in their whole lineup. You realize that we have over 5,000 labels. I mean, everybody likes to focus on, for some reason on the Internet, they like to focus on Duracoat, you know. But Duracoat is only one product of ours. We have over 5,000 labels. If, if All you, if, firearm finishing products. If you have... If you have anything on a gun that needs, like you have woods, you know, wood finishes, wood refinishes, yeah, you name it. And, and all that jazz, uh, and so you know, I've been telling people like, look, it's if you have an ugly gun, you're and you're you admit ah, that thing's pretty ugly, uh, it's, it's all hacked up, and, and you really have no excuse today. Your excuses are over now. Five years ago, you'd say, well, I'm not packing that thing up and shipping it to a guy. Okay, cool. Or I'm not paying the local guy to, you know, $300 or $250 to, to redo my gun. Okay. <laughs> your excuses are over. You can go to Brownells. You guys sell all your stuff on Brownells, right? 
Well, you can or, buy a brown owl. You can yeah. buy it Midway USA. You can buy from Houch. You can buy from uh, Caswell. I mean, we have lots of outlets. Um, we have them all over the world, actually. And uh, but you can still buy directly from us. You can call or go on our website and order. Yeah, and uh, you can go to uh, Duraco's Facebook page and you can vote for the Student of the Gun gun tattoo. There you go. One of our <laughs> yeah, they were like one of our grad program members. They, they follow all the pictures that we put up of the guns that we refinish, and I've been kind of losing my mind putting gun tattoos on. Like everything, <laughs> <laughs> I told Steve yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, you know, they're like, hey, like tell those guys to do a student of the gun gun tattoo. I when I talked to Amy a, a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about the Crusader rifle, and I said you guys really need to do a uh, Crusader cross, uh, you know, like a two inch size Crusader yeah. cross uh, as a gun tattoo. I think that would really be. I, I know the audience would just jump all over that. Hey, I happen to walk by the. Uh the area of the building here where we have the order computers and uh i just walked in there and i took a look and there was a there was an email on there that this guy wants a student of the gun tattoo <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah. because you guys told him to call so, so apparently we're, we're in the student of the gun tattoo thing now <laughs> <laughs> now amy's the one that that handles the the patterns and whatnot isn't she the sheet, the, like the new yeah. patterns and what have you. Yep. Yep. She happens to answer the phone, too. And, so. Yeah, every once in a while. Well, <laughs> Jared, every once in a while, accidentally answers the phone, too, doesn't he, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> I had that one time where I was in the shop, I was in the studio here, and everyone had left me. <laughs> really. I just don't answer the phone sometimes. And, and everyone Sorry, had guys. left me and, and walked out, and the phone rang, and I was like, crap, I'm I was, like, writing an, art, an article or something. I was like, well, I better pick it up. And it was a, one of the guys who listened to the show, and he had a question. He's like, is this Paul? I'm like, yeah. He said, you answered the own fo- your own phone. I'm like, well, everyone abandoned me. <laughs> they all left. I, so I thought, well, well right. It's That's cool, the problem right? with being the boss. You're always the first one there and the last one to go home. Yeah. So, every, <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, we're, we're having a lot of fun here. And for those of you guys that don't know it, Steve likes to have fun. And one of his favorite people in the world <laughs> is a gentleman named uh, Nanny Michael Bloomberg. And Nanny is a big fan of Duraco. And as a matter of fact, I think Nanny gets a catalog every year, doesn't he? Does he get a new catalog? Yeah, he certainly does. Yeah. <laughs> How did that Among work other out? other things, you know, he's gotten our our little thongs, and he's gotten, you know, the Just Shoot It thongs, and he's gotten the bobbleheads, and... All sorts of things. T-shirts. I love the T-shirts. You know, down the back, it just goes bang, 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 bang forever. When you get down to the bottom, it goes click, click. <laughs> I'm sure that was one of his favorites. <laughs> uh, tell, tell the story about um, about uh, Nanny Bloomberg and Duracoat. Oh, boy. You know, one day, all of a sudden, you know, I get this phone call. One of the guys comes up to me and he says, uh, you've got a, you know, I don't have an office or anything like that. I, I work with everybody here. So I'm running around in the building, whatever. And it's, one of my guys comes up to me and says, you got a New York City reporter on the phone. Oh, boy, what's that about? Okay. So I took that. And he, uh, he said he was standing outside of the press conference room at City Hall in New York City. And the mayor had just decided to ban our product from the city of New York. Whoa. That's the best free marketing ever. That's yeah, that's the, the, wild. The and paint, I'm sitting back the, the and I'm going, color. you know what? Usually I, I only get to to preach to the choir. Everybody that I preach to about gun rights and whatever is all you know, a pro gunner. This guy just gave me a venue. Mayor Bloomberg just gave me a venue. So I went on talking about what it was and all of this. And, and, and the reason that this all happened was, back in 1999, they passed a law in New York City that all toy guns had to be fluorescent or pastel. And when the mayor got a hold of one of my catalogs and saw that I have those types of colors, you know, and of course, we are the innovators of those colors within the firearm industry. He didn't like that. So you mean there you we go. Actually... Now it's against the law. They, they actually got it passed. Um, it's against the law to have Duracoat in New York City. Uh, he allowed five colors. I don't remember offhand, but they're like OD green and black and that kind of thing. Other than that, it's jail time. For 
For po- mere possession of Duracoat in New York City is a year in jail. Wow. <laughs> and there's a, there's a monetary fine, too, and I, I mean, that's escaping me right now. Man, if any of you guys that are listening are in New York City, you need to get out. Well, we, I, don't, I don't think our signal's allowed in New York. Yeah, they well, block it. <laughs> it. It gets better than that. New York City had been buying Duracoat from me for years, <laughs> the, the, the police department. Wow. You know, and uh, the guy that was purchasing it, the actual purchaser of, of the Duracoat, the guy that would order from us, he got busted. He, he had a nice suit and tie job. He got busted back down to uh, a, a beat cop on the most dangerous square mile in New York City. And he was two years from retirement, so he had to stay there, you know, to get his retirement. He came to see me at SHOT Show. I thought, you know, when he introduced himself, I thought, oh, no, here we go. But he thanked me. Wow. You know, but yeah, he had a rough job for a couple of years. Jeez. <laughs> that is the insanity. That he, call, is the insane he called me up, uh, oh, maybe a year into that. You know, he had a, maybe a year left, and he said he had one of his officers die in his arms that day. Jeez. I mean, somebody that's that square mile, something crazy, like somebody dies in there every day, you know, by violence. Well, it's obviously because they had Duracoated guns. Um, the, yeah. I, I know that. Yeah. Uh, and to this day, now that you know, this this took place back in 2006 is when they got this law passed uh, to ban us from their city. But I I continued with uh, Mr. Bloomberg for four years from 2006 to 2010 in the media. We actually had uh, you know all the major networks were out here one day. I mean, the parking lot was full of satellites. I mean, all the <laughs> stuff going on. Um, I uh, you know New York. Daily News calls calls us up one day and says, hey, we want to come to your shop. You know? Uh, okay, when do you want to come? How about 9 o'clock tomorrow morning? They already had their flights and everything. Everything was set up. They showed up here at 9 o'clock in the morning. They stayed for four or five hours and video and took pictures of all the Duracoat packages going out. And we got a little gun store in the front out here, and they took pictures. Of all. It was just crazy. But that went on for, you know, four years. And finally, when, you know, it started out Mayor Bloomberg, you know, when there was an article, and I mean, there was, there was at least 100, I remember 80 of them, 80, I lost track around 80, you know, of interviews, articles, and magazines, and whatever. And, and they, took, uh, they took pictures of all this kind of stuff, and, and as, you know, it started out with Mayor Bloomberg having a big picture in the article, and in, and in the article, and maybe I had just a little picture. And as time went on, pretty soon I had a picture about the same size as his. And then pretty soon, my picture was bigger than his. And then by 2010, it was only my picture, and he wasn't even on it. That's when he stopped responding. Uh, it's like it dried right up. That someone told him, like, okay, you need to, like... You need to just stop talking to this guy because you're... Yeah, you're, yeah, i got to stop. This guy's beating me. He's be, yeah, look, let's go do something else. Let's go to Oregon and give them some money to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, to, to get going. For reasonable gun control. And but I, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy because the uh, the Bloomberg thing lives on. You know, we, 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 we uh, coated up a rifle that, you know, in the New York City graffiti. You know, it's really a nice-looking gun. And, and if we don't bring it to a show, some somebody, at least somebody's going to say, hey, I want to see that gun. I want to show that gun to my buddy, whatever. So we have to bring it all the time. Every, yeah, that, that one, the brick and mortar graffiti gun. The brick there. and mortar, yes. Yeah, that has to go to every show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My daughter Amy, she did that gun up, and uh, she's got, uh, I, I believe, thirty-four bullet holes in the brick that are two scale in nine millimeter and forty-five ACP. You know, it's fun stuff like that. And for a good time, call one eight hundred, and it's the mayor's office phone number <laughs> that kind of stuff i mean it's full of, i mean it's something to see oh man i tell you what it's it's you know you just gotta have fun you gotta have fun and that's why one of the reasons i wanted to have you on uh we thought we were gonna have somebody else on too to, to, to debate but you know what the heck is to let the people on the uh, in the audience to most most people can't actually meet you you know they they you know, you go to NRA or something like that, but let's let's face facts. Most people that listen to the show, most people that are out there, don't have an opportunity to actually to to hear you speak and to just uh, you know understand. Don't see me at shows like Shot Show, uh, NRA. I mean, we're big NRA people. Um, we sponsor our our local NRA friends of NRA. The Indian Head chapter here. There's 24 chapters in in Wisconsin. We donate. We're, we're suppressor manufacturers. We're firearm manufacturers. We donate 22 caliber suppressors to all 24 chapters every year. We donate 
firearms. We have a Lower Custom Weaponry hat raffle at, at our local Indian Head chapter where we, where we donate three rifles alone just to that. We donate rifles to the state convention. We donate rifles to the uh, NRA National for NRA uh, Foundation, for NRA ILA, the legislative branch. We do all sorts of stuff like that. Now, Steve, are you guys going to be at the, uh, the NASGW? Yes. Good. Excellent. Yes. So that's in, yes, our, that's in, that's in our backyard this year. Um, we're, we're only 90 minutes away from there. So, wow. So, yeah. Well, I'm probably about that, too. By airplane. By airplane. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I'll sit for three hours in the airport. <laughs> yeah. No, we're going to actually get in a car and drive over. Uh, but yeah. So. Well, yeah, it's, it's in New Orleans yeah, this in, year, and that's, sure is. that is that is one place I've never been, so this is going to be interesting. Oh, very good. We, we, uh, we're kind of... You know, we live in Biloxi, but we're kind of New Orleans natives. Uh, we, we know the city very well. And the cool thing about New Orleans, unlike most major metropolitan areas that are crime-ridden and they try and convince you to disarm yourself, New Orleans is crime-ridden, but they don't try to disarm you. So there's, <laughs> you know, New York City and Chicago and all those places, they're, they're filthy and they're crime-ridden, and they try to make you disarm yourself. At least Isn't New that or- crazy? In, in New I mean, Orleans, is that, they is don't. Is that like a mental disease? It is. It's actually... It's, it's a- I mean, you take that shooting out in Oregon. Well, you know, if you had uh, a teacher or two in there with a gun, it would have been nasty, but it wouldn't have been so nasty. Well, I mean, when you can when you can stand people up and interview them, you know, that that's the insanity of that whole situation is people are like, oh, you know, the, the, the other side, the left, the statist, they're like, they, they love to throw out these... these specious uh, little arguments about how oh it it's so it's so uh shocking and devastating and it doesn't matter whether you had a gun or not it just you couldn't fight back like all right stop moron if you're trying to tell me that somebody walked in to like a crowded movie theater and just emptied their gun and ran out and the whole event took 30 seconds i might be willing to give you that but when you're standing people up and asking them questions that's a slaughter. Right. Yeah, that's not... And that's time not, to reload. Yeah, reloading I mean, what's wrong your with guns. the people, though, too? How come they don't fight back? Even exactly. though they don't have arms, that they've been you would programmed. think they fight back. They've been programmed over and over Shelter and over in place. again. That's Shelter in place is, is, is training people to be victims, training them to be subservient. You know, brother, as long as I've been alive... Uh, you know, every every so often, somebody, a, a security or law enforcement expert, will come out and like, uh, in the event that you ever find yourself in an active crime situation, uh, you know, don't fight back, don't make eye contact, uh, you know, do your best to just be a good witness, and that that nausea. That, ugh. That's been going on. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm blood not pressure. using your face is getting red over there. I'm not using bad words because this is a public hour, but. And uh, but that crap has been going on since I was a teenager, uh, you know. With well, that was a long time. Ago. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> well, when uh, you know when all the hijackings, the hijackings to Cuba, you remember that? Yeah. Like every week, there's a hijacking to Cuba or something, yep. and the you know the security experts, you know, if you're ever on a plane that's hijacked, don't fight back, don't make eye contact. Try to be a good witness, blah, 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 blah. And how'd that work out on 9-11, uh, 2001? Right. And why, why can you know, a bunch of goat rapist monsters get onto uh, planes with box cutters and drive them into buildings? Because they knew every single person on that plane had been preconditioned to be a good little victim. They had been told over and over and over again, you know, just be a good witness. Don't fight back. No, you hit the nail on the head. And... That's when you say how, how how can people just like stand around and allow themselves to be shot in the head? That's exactly how, because you can't make it up. You know, people are like, oh, if I'm ever in it, no. It, once the situation begins, you can't like start coming up with solutions if you don't have a solution before that, or at least a plan before that. You're not going to make it up on the spot. You're going to go with what you've ever de- what you defaulted to, and sadly, most of these people's default is. Don't fight back. Don't argue. Don't be, you know, don't risk it. It's not worth injury, you know, blah, blah, blah. Hoping, well, maybe this monster will be merciful and, and won't, you know, you're reliant upon the mercy of a psychotic monster. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to put my, uh, my faith in life in the hands of a psychotic monster. 
no, that wouldn't happen. No. I avoid gun-free zones. I mean, this is where 90% of this stuff takes place, in gun-free zones. Oh, yeah, because they're not you stupid. Know, they know. If, if, if there's an establishment in our area that has, uh, has a no-gun thing, I don't go there. Mm. I'm not going to a theater that doesn't allow me to carry. I carry everywhere. I yeah. carry to bed. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not going to be a victim. Nope. Uh, well, all right, Steve, I appreciate you joining us today. I know you're a busy guy, and I know you're actually prepping for Yeah, for no, the yeah trip and i got to head to the airport pretty quick Sorry. here. In about, i got about 10 minutes. i got to be over there. All right. <laughs> okay, and, Steve. And i got to, you know, it, it's just, it just uh, i got to go to Louisville, down to the Knob Creek Range, and, and just gunfire like crazy. Live Machine like guns, man. explosions, the Tannerite, the whole thing. It's yeah. just great. After That's all these fun. years of going there, it's still exciting. Make time to go to Knob Creek. We were talking about that the other day, you and I. Yep. Well, we're you were, we're so busy saving the world that we hardly have time for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Steve, my friend, Steve Lauer from Duracoat. Thank you very much for joining us on Student of the Gun Radio today. We truly appreciate your time and your support of the nation, not just the NRA, not just the Second Amendment, the support of the Republic, and we appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Uh, SDS Imports, the title sponsor of Student of the Gun Radio, this month for the uh, giveaway, the SOTG giveaway contest, it's SOTGgiveaway.com. Uh, we've got, they've got a giveaway of a, an, a TSOS 1911 A1 U.S. Army 9 mil. Oh. Yes, it's a 9 mil 1911. That is interesting to me. I have the 45 version, and the 45 version is very, it's a very, very faithful reproduction of the original 1911 GI. Oh, the gee. GI 1911. And I think the 9 mil holds two more rounds. I think the magazine, I, I, I don't, don't, uh, don't quote me on that. I'll have to look at it, look it up. But I believe the nine mil holds two more rounds. But either way, if you'd like to win a free nine millimeter nineteen eleven, go to sotggiveaway.com. That's sotggiveaway.com. And when you do that, if you fill out the form properly, uh, you will be eligible to win that gun, and it'll ship to your FFL dealer near you. So. Very cool. Uh, we did we did a video about the the forty five ACP version, um, and it was uh, well. It's available. It's available. I dressed up. I wore the steel pot and all that good stuff. So check it out. Check it out at uh, sdsimports.com. All right. One more. Uh, what other? What we talked about Brownells. Thank you to Brownells. We talked about the cans. We talked about the holsters and the arc bag. Now it's probably a great time to get the arc bag. Uh, and then the one thing I did put in my arc bag and I told you guys why I did it and I did it on purpose. I put a high point C nine in there because I, if I put it, I put it in there you know, I test fired it. It, it works just fine. I loaded up the magazines with, with good ammo, black Hills ammo, put it in the arc bag, folded it up, put it in a backpack in a go bag and it lives there and it's going to live there. And if there's ever a crisis or an emergency where I have to grab that bag and go, in that bag will be every, the fundamentals. There's a there's a, a a kit. There's a med kit in there. There's a flashlight. There's a surefire light in there. There's uh, a knife in there, and there is a, uh, a high point C9 with two magazines stuffed full of and a holster full of Black Hills uh, jacketed hollow point ammunition. And I pulled it out the other day, actually last week. I opened it up. I went into it, and everything in there looks like it's brand new. The brass is shiny. Uh, there, the flashlight and the battery still work. Um, everything looks like, like it's brand new. There's, there's no corrosion, nothing. And that's, you know, a good thing. That's a, it's a good thing. So there you go. Attention new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called seven training tips that could save your life. 
Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. I got a calendar notification that I had a meeting with somebody at 10 a.m., and but it was for tomorrow. I was like, oh, no, I didn't do that to myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I deliberately block out Tuesdays every week yeah. indeed indubitably i do as well all right now we uh this gentleman that we have is uh his name is scott hambrick he is the he well, he's a man of many parts uh but w- the parts that we're concerned about is his uh, online great books tutelage and also of course uh he's one of our original coaches from the uh Barbell Logic program. We're going to talk to him about strength. We're going to talk to him about education. We're going to talk to him about the future of the nation, uh, about gold and fake currency and all kinds of stuff. You're not going to want to miss this interview. Uh, and it's going to be well worth your time. Uh, so, and next for the, your information, for your FYI, FYI, the online great books enrollment is open this week. It closes soon. It's going to be closed on Sunday, this coming Sunday. So go to studentofthegun.com slash OGB to get all the information you need. And if you're listening to this in future past and it's closed when you hear this and you go to that URL, that's fine. You can sign up for the VIP waiting list and you'll get a bunch of great content there. Uh, One of the things I really like about Scott and the way that he runs online great books is he focuses heavily on providing a lot of value for free to show that, hey, this thing's worth paying for because the value you're going to get when you actually start paying for the membership far exceeds the, the value that you get when you're a free person. There you you're go. a free people. When you're a free person. I'm a free person. Yeah. Free studentofthegun.com slash OGB. All right, guys. Uh, <laughs> I like the way the screen is. It's like, oh, it's like the Brady Bunch, only not. So we, we got Scott Hambrick here from, from Online Great Books and scotthambrick.com and, and uh, curmudgeon.com. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about books today and reading and, and, and money and, how, and all kinds of stuff. But uh, welcome, Scott. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I was laying in bed. Uh, reading it's too cold and wet it's raining and like 32 outside so i must mm. not go out and do any of my any outdoor work so i was laying in bed reading about uh um how the eurasians are so much smarter than us and are uh, uh moving their currencies towards the metal base and have, have a, the petrodollar is dead and the uh hegemony of the american dollar in the global marketplace is dead and uh yeah, just just reveling in that this morning, and then Jared called and said, "Did you forget we got, we're, we're recording it now?" <laughs> <laughs> you know that that's something yeah, I don't. Th- Jared and Zach, do you do you guys, you sons of mine, uh, sons of mine, do you rem- do you remember or understand that we used to be on this thing called the gold standard? And do you know what the gold standard means? I yes. know about it. I don't know if I was ever alive when we went off of it. No, I, you weren't alive. Yeah, yeah I, I know what it is. Yes. Our time. So they, we used to use a term in, in our common vernacular called the gold standard. If something was the gold standard, that meant it was, you know, relied upon. It was it was sure it was solid. You know, we, we used to refer to things as, oh, that's the gold standard of blah, blah, blah. Because in, in our world, the countries wouldn't just rely on other countries for the, for their money. For instance, in Germany, uh, they didn't have a gold standard and they just printed money. Scott knows about this. The, that was Weimar Republic. So like, Hey man, we're just print more money. And so countries looked at each other like, mm, yeah, we're not just going to trust the value of your notional paper money that you just came up with. And most nations in the world, accepted and understood the gold standard and the gold standard basically was we would only print the amount of money that we had gold in fort knox and when i was a little kid 
you, you, you talk about Fort Knox. You know, Fort Knox was this mythical place, this, this you know, this. Uh, and, and in my mind, I envisioned it like a giant fortification, like this castle, you know, when I was a little kid. And, and inside the castle, the castle was filled with gold. And, and we printed money based upon how much gold we had. You know, this is me as a little kid understanding this. And then as I got older, someone said, yeah, if you went to Fort Knox today, you could walk into a big empty room and there's a piece of paper in the middle of the floor and it says i owe you oh yeah it's it's worse than that even paul <laughs> it's worse than an empty room with a with a piece of paper that says i owe you it's worse than that even yeah we, we were on a gold standard for all a long long time starting in 1792 <laughs> the government said if you bring me an ounce of gold i will give you 19 dollars and 39 cents or how about this you can bring me nineteen dollars and thirty nine cents, me being the government, and mm -hmm. I will give you one ounce of gold. It was readily exchangeable at that fixed rate, and it was fixed at that for, gosh, uh, well here, let me look it up real quick. It was fixed at that till eighteen thirty four, and they bumped it to twenty dollars and sixty nine cents. So that's inflation, you know. An ounce of gold, they now give you twenty dollars and sixty nine cents, and it was fixed at that for a long time, and then the Civil War happened, and you know. During war, people like to get crazy, and it went up into the kind of the forty dollar area. And, and remember, when somebody says the price of gold went up, the price of gold didn't change. The dollar went down. An ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. It not always is. So when you see the price of gold change, it's mostly about the value of the dollar changing. So when the price of gold goes up, it's still an ounce of gold, guys. It's just it takes more tickets from the Federal Reserve to get somebody to let go of that gold. So and then after the Civil War, it went back down into the around in the twenty dollars sixty seven cents. And it was that for a long, long time. And then we had World War One. And uh, we bumped it up um, to twenty dollars and sixty seven cents. And then in the 30s, it went to thirty five. Now. Roosevelt, our first communist president, not our last one, but our first communist president, made it illegal to hold gold. And they confiscated all the gold they could get their hands on. Of course, a lot was keistered and buried, and they weren't able to get it. But they got a lot of it off of the market. And that stuff would have gone into, like you said, Fort Knox. And you've seen Fort Knox at, in the Goldfinger movie. Yeah, yeah, the Goldfinger. Yeah, and so you got, and then World War II comes, and the Americans say, hey, listen, we're better than the island nation of United Kingdom in terms of security. All of you European countries, bring your gold here and, and we'll keep it safe for you. Real safe. So the reserves of a lot of our allied countries and some of those that were conquered uh, came here. We still have a lot of other countries reserves supposedly so you said you can kick the door open and there's an iou laying on the floor there's not just one iou there's also one for germany and for <laughs> so many others whose reserves we supposedly were keeping safe for them um and then you know, blah 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 eh, after world war ii it goes to around 35 bucks so this is still inflationary it's still inflationary but then in 1971 um uh, one of our presidents who wasn't a communist, but they took him out, Nixon. So since, in, in my opinion, since Roosevelt, we've had a handful of non-communist presidents. Kennedy, they killed him. They took Nixon out. If you think Nixon is the first guy to bug his opponent's headquarters, you're crazy. Reagan came out strong. They shot him. His politics changed shortly after that. And then Trump. And then, of course, they took him out. Anyway, Nixon closed what they called the gold window, where the government promised to exchange dollars for gold and gold for dollars at a fixed price. He closed that in 1971. So if you go and don't don't believe anything I'm saying, don't believe it. Up. Go check it out. Go check it out. Go look at an inflation chart and you'll see it's real flat until 1971 and it hockey sticks. It goes up, 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 up. And you can also go look up these charts about um, – uh, working class wages and cost of living, and you'll see that inflation adjusted working class wages are down. And you notice when they start going down, 1971. Hmm. Well, 
you can only print money so long and trick people so long, and pretty soon they realize that those tickets they get from the Federal Reserve Bank just don't buy as much bread and butter as they used to. And, uh, well, right uh, in 19, I believe it was in 1944, we had a stable currency. We had lots of other countries' gold reserves, and there was a conference held at Bretton Woods where the countries who believed they were going to win the war tried to figure out what the economic order of the world would look like and how they would do trade after the war. And at Bretton Woods, they decided that the global medium of exchange would be the American dollar. And since then, it has been the global medium of exchange. In 1971, uh, Nixon under the Nixon administration, it was destabilized a lot when they removed the gold window. 1971. Well, we would all know, or maybe we don't all know, but a lot of us know about the OPEC fuel and petroleum shortages of the early 70s. Well, that all happened shortly after the 1971 gold window closure. Well, somehow, we got the Saudis to agree to only accept dollars for their products. Now, I remember I said that the government in the past would tell you, uh, bring me these do- this many dollars and I'll give you an ounce of gold, or bring me an ounce of gold and I'll give you this many dollars. Mm-hmm. The Saudis mm-hmm. essentially did that with oil. Yeah. So now we're not a now we're not a gold backed uh, currency. We're an oil backed currency. Hence now, the petrodollar. And they call that the petrodollar. Uh, oil prices are not as stable as gold. It has industrial uses. It depletes more than gold and so on. So it's not as stable as gold. But it's not completely fiat. It's not completely uncoupled from reality. And we had the petrodollar. Well, about two weeks ago, the Saudis said, you know, we think we'll probably take the yuan, some gold, and some rubles for our products. They haven't committed to that 100%, but they will. Why wouldn't they? They would be foolish to continue to take the dollar. The petrodollar is gone. The crude oil peg for the value of the dollar that was represented by the petrodollar will be gone. If you say that that it was fiat four weeks ago, and it kind of was, it was still held down. The value of the dollar was still held down by petroleum demand and production. Some. Some. It could pump the brakes a little bit on inflation. That's gone. That's gone. Uh, Russia and China and increasingly India are no longer going to be as interested in accepting the dollar as a medium of exchange for international trade. So Bretton Woods is essentially gone. People are going to flee the dollar uh, internationally. We can't. You know, I'm in Oklahoma. Nobody's going to take a fucking ruble for a can of beans in o- Oklahoma. Yet, yeah, wait. <laughs> but we, so we're not going to have a choice here in the United States. I mean, that's kind of the currency. Not kind of. No, so I say kind of. But internationally, like the, the Russians don't have to take dollars for their natural gas. The Chinese don't have to take dollars for their junk. They don't have to do that. So they're not going to because. Uh, that, well, it's bad money. It's decreasing in value, and it leaves their nations poor. So they're going to elect to not do that, and they're announcing that globally. April Now, last, yes, last night, or I guess earlier today, um, Putin said April 1st, they're no longer going to accept anything but rubles for natural gas. Germany alone uses 9 billion cubic feet of natural gas every day. And almost all of that comes from Russia. Now, Germany is, you know, it's not our greatest ally. We all know who our greatest ally is, but they're one of our greatest (laughs) allies. Our greatest ally. Uh, They're one of them, and they're going to be put in a position to look our diplomats right in the eye and say, hey, uh, you remember that Bretton Woods thing? Fuck it. We're done. We have to. Our people are freezing to death. We can't make fertilizer. Uh, We can't cook food. We can't do anything. We can't generate electricity. We're going to have to cough up some rubles for these cats. So meanwhile, (laughs) Russia has announced that they will exchange so many rubles at a fixed rate for a gram of gold. 
they have essentially n- announced that they are gold rising, I guess you would say again. They're headed back towards a metals backed security, a metals backed currency. That is a big, big deal. That's something that we should have done in 1972. <laughs> but they're doing it right now. And it just so happens that the arbitrage, the price differences between what the ruble gold price that they have dictated that they will pay and then the ruble dollar price that exists out in the marketplace means that it's going to, they're going to suck money out of dollars into rubles because you can, for every time you, you, you go swap a dollar for gold and then back to ruble. And so I, it's complex, but there's a, some, some small price differences there that will allow people to make an arbitrage spread. So anytime that somebody takes Russia up on that deal, they're going to make a little bit of money. They're being incentivized to get rid of their dollars, essentially. So Yahtzee, all of this kind of stuff takes 18 months or two years for you to see it at your grocery store. Trump started printing trillions of dollars because of the the Chinese aids, right? Makes perfect sense. Uh, 18 months, two years later, you start seeing the inflation. Gasoline's what it is. You know, a dozen eggs has doubled in price. Fertilizer has tripled. It It takes months to see these things. It doesn't happen immediately. The, th- the events of the last three or four weeks are going to take 18 months to two years to see. And when they happen, it's, it's, it's going to be extraordinarily destabilizing here. There you go. There you, you go. You want to talk about books now? Yeah. So, so what are your plan <laughs> for the, for the economic apocalypse, which is, which has been set and put in motion, uh, by the criminals in Washington, DC, uh, what are you going to read? I'm on scotthambrick.com right now. And how deep, where, where, online great books, where is the list? Oh, gosh. It's, well, it's, it's one of the blog posts here. I guess I could put it in the, in the sideline here. It's called the Apocalypse Book List. You go on there and, and you'll see a column there that says articles. And I don't know, it's five or six posts down the Apocalypse Book List. You go to scotthambrick.com slash article slash prepper hyphen book hyphen list and there it is whatever um yeah and it, it there's a mix of things there we go yeah a mix of things i think are classics and a th- list of things that give you information i think you might need yeah so i don't see any of my books on this shame oh, on him um the this stemmed from something else. You had posted something about uh, one of your articles was something about living in interesting times, I think was the title of it. And in there, you also, you were kind of warning people. It's like, hey, we're, we're living in interesting times. This is kind of what's coming down the pipeline from my point of view. And here are the things that you need to make sure you have at your house as far as nutrition goes, um, being able to survive. Yeah. on food right. so then i presume what you got after that was hey you're a book guy scott if you're going to talk about what we need as far as food and nutrition then what do we need as far as books and is that kind of how it went down yeah that's exactly right and you know i bet you guys get this stuff all the time if you if you say hey uh these are the 12 must have things in your uh first aid kit your you know your everyday carry or whatever Every every jackweed in the universe is like, oh, you forgot, uh, whatever. Yeah. Or they're like, oh, why did you have that in there? That's retarded, don't you? So you know those guys immediately show up. But uh, no one's going to use duct tape, right? Uh, tampons? What? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, That's dude. the stupidest thing I ever heard. Oh, oh. That's funny. I put links of it, links to these in the chat if you wanted to drop them in Discord or whatever. Yeah, so this apocalypse book list, uh, it's in no particular order. It's in the order they came to my mind as I was looking at my own bookshelf, really. Uh, number one on here are the Foxfire books. You guys ever seen those things? No. That was I actually know what, the I know number what one fox is. Yeah. I don't know what a Foxfire is. The number one book. I was like, dang, I've never even heard of that. Yeah, you need the Foxfire books. Uh, I'm going to get some of this wrong, but it's from memory. There was a guy who I think he was a high school teacher in uh, northern Florida, uh, southern Georgia. And he he put together this little newsletter, and these kids in the 70s 
were uh, started interviewing like their grandparents uh, about the old ways. Oh, this I remember like you situation. talking about this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so these kids would go into Appalachia and just interview these people about these old folk ways. And they would take pictures and write up these articles. And they had them, like, I think, in a, in a school newsletter. And then they, they turned them into these books. I think there are nine of them. There's probably 1,800 pages. And they talk about all these skills that are now lost. Tanning hides, uh, making a banjo, canning, digging a well, how to build a smokehouse. Just almost just innumerable. But distilling whiskey. Like all kinds of stuff that is... It's fascinating to read one. I mean, just, you know, the, these older folks that are long dead now telling these stories and it being documented so well, it's just a great read, but it's all there. There's step-by-step instructions for everything. And you can duplicate everything in the books on your own if you wanted to. So those things are full of practical knowledge and they're awesome to have. I, I, I ran, ran into those things when I was maybe in the sixth or seventh grade. I couldn't, I couldn't put them down. Holy Fast crap. Up. You know where you can get this, Jared? The Foxfire series? Yeah. Uh, where? At Layman's Hardware in Kidron, Ohio. No way. They That's funny. Website. That's our old stomping ground. Yeah. That's funny. Do your people know about Layman's Hardware? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Our people know about Layman's yeah. Hardware. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Layman's. Layman's. And uh, they've got Foxfire books. And, you know, you could probably pick them up at your used bookstore. I mean, they've been in publication for 50 years. You'll, you'll be able to find them. Uh, you, need, you need those darn things. And, and much in the same vein is the second book or set of books, the David Gingery books. There's this dude. He's dead now. His name is David Gingery. And he was broke. I think he was in Arkansas. And he's like, I would sure like to have a machine shop, but I'm broke. He fucking built one with nothing. That is awesome. With nothing. So it's interesting that um, you can you can build a lathe, like a crude lathe. You just spin something and put a tool against it, and you can cut a, a rough cylinder. And then once you have a rough cylinder, you can use that rough cylinder to make a better cylinder and get more and more parallel surfaces and then once you, so you can use a lathe to build a lathe and once you have a lathe you can build everything else in a machine shop so this guy essentially started with nothing and builds an entire machine machine shop the david gingery books tell you step by step with measured drawings how to start with nothing but a hope and end up with a machine shop it's interesting because with these books that we're talking about right now uh, Dad, you remember the conversation that you and I had about uh, problem solving and what you need to be the, the best skill you can have in a, an apocalypse situation or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. after the dollar collapses. The best skill that you can have is the ability to be able to solve your own problems. To be that's a problem exactly, solver. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what this dude did. He's like, man, I really want this thing. I don't have the resources, but there's got to be a way. So I'm going to sit down and think about this. And then I'm actually going to put it into action. And so that's the real life living examples of being a problem solver and how it could really benefit you. And then not only you, but this dude turned this into books and now it's benefiting however many people have read the book. Oh, it's, it's brilliant. I know, I know uh, two people who have built his lathe. Um, I mean, I, I've seen it work. It, it's, and there's like, there are some, um, there's one I think called Maker Lab is a channel on YouTube, and a guy has built his lathe, his shaper, uh, several things step by step on YouTube. Uh, it's it's amazing, and uh, you need that one. Whether you intend to build a lathe tomorrow or not, you probably ought to buy the books. If you think that the dollar might be a little bit sword, maybe you ought to put the book on the <laughs> shelf, and you might have it. Maybe right? Maybe maybe maybe. Uh, the next two books are kind of the same. The Encyclopedia of Country Living by Carla Emery. Same kind of stuff. Canning, folkways, how do you how do you incubate chickens, chicken eggs. I mean, just all that kind of stuff. Um, and then of course the all new ball book of canning and preserving. You know, if you're into if you if you're gonna do canning, you do pressure canning and water bath canning, that is the Bible for that. If you want to stay safe and keep food a long time. 
that is the one as far as I can tell. It's almost like the people that make the jars would know how to use them for canning. Yeah, for hundreds of years. Yeah, They they may have a conflict of interest. They might recommend ball products. Yeah. (laughs) But But the recipes are good. We use that. Or my wife uses that, and well, I can with her. You know, we use it all the time. It's a great book. So yeah, that's something you know. When we talk about these books, uh, when, when we were growing up, or when our you know when our grandparents, the, the knowledge that's in these books was common knowledge. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, something that was like a super secret. Like there's only only one guy knows how to make whiskey or whatever. Uh, it was it was a product of necessity. I mean, when we when I was a little kid, uh, we moved into my great grandparents' house. My great grandparents passed away, and so we moved into we bought their house, and we bought their house. You know, basically as is, which meant my grandfather's my great grandfather's workshop was in place, and I literally would spend hours and hours and hours as a 12 year old in my great grandfather's workshop. And when I think about it, there, there were, there were things that he did. He, he was the problem solver. He was, he was a plumber by trade. So he was actually a, a skilled technician. And if he needed something, he would manufacture it. He would retrofit it. He would create it. He would fabricate it. Uh, and and now looking back with my brain, I can see because that was the mind. He was a fully grown adult during the depression, you know, and so and he you know did what he needed to do. They built the house in Detroit, which would go for a you know, half a million dollars today if it was still sitting there. But uh, it's Detroit, and it got burned to the ground. But um, <laughs> and invaded. Yeah, it got invaded and burned to the ground. But you know that mentality. And, you know, my great grandfather, he was a fabricator. He was a problem solver if he needed to do something. And, you know, I remember my dad saying, oh, that was your grandpa's fix for that. You know, we, we would we would find something some way, you know, with rubber bands on it or, or soldered or, or whatever. And my dad's like, yeah, well, well, your grandpa just fixed. He just fixed it himself. Uh, and, yeah. and that's how that was the call that. If you yeah, to call that like a jury rig, you know. Oh, yeah, you rigged that up. Look, what are you going to do? But yeah, that but that's what they knew. And and it it for for our great grandparents, they never would think I need to call someone to come to my house and fix this thing. They would just fix it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was a super fantastical bonus type uh, episode of Student of the Gun Radio. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, well, you know what you guys should do. You should jump on over uh, to the, uh, what is it, Jared? GetSOTG.com? Yes, GetSOTG.com. And tomorrow we will be airing the rest of the interview with Scott Hambrick, specifically for our grad program members. And we hope to have you there with us. Like I said last week, the value that you're going to get for your dollar to sign up for the grad program for the trial is going to far far exceed that dollar. There you go. All right. Uh, and oh, one more thing, Zach, before I let the listening audience go, I saw that, and I didn't even know this was a thing, that you created a new product, I, a Dad Rules coffee mug. Yes, what? I did. Yeah. Uh, that is so cool. Yes, indeed. It, it's the one of the coolest things I've ever done. But yeah, right now on shopsotg.com, not only is there a brand new coffee mug for your enjoyment, but also all coffee mugs are on sale right now. Until, for a limited time only. So it, it's on the homepage. On the homepage. Uh, it, it's, it's the cover of the Dad Rules book. So if you guys are looking for a gift for your father, uh, because your father has a birthday this spring, or you know, you're know you planning ahead for Father's Day, uh, that, that is a, that's a cool thing. I like that. I, I really do. That's a, it's a really cool little uh, image, a little graphic there, a little picture. Uh, somebody who looked... A lot like I used to look. Yeah. <laughs> You've only got about, what, six weeks until Father's Day? Um, what? No, that's Mother's Day. Ju- Mother's really? Day's in May, Father's Day's in June. Well, yeah, it's April. Four weeks would be May. Six weeks would be June. Wow. 
I have a good memory sometimes. Yeah, okay. All right. June 19th, 2022 is Father's Day. So, yeah, right now would be a good time to go ahead and get that shipped over to you. That's right. Get it ordered, man. Your dad will your dad will think it's fantastic. And your dad will think you rule. That's right. He'll think you rule. So I just wanted to bring that up because Zach. Yeah. Zach did that, and I wanted to acknowledge it. So Sweet, there you go. good job. Thank you, Slash. All right, guys. Remember, we'll see. Well, we'll see. Talk to a lot of you tomorrow. But remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. We appreciate your reviews. If you haven't left a review or updated yours recently, head on over to Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player to voice your opinion. Don't forget to join us at The Student Lounge, a place for like-minded individuals to learn, connect, and support each other. No chicanery will be tolerated. Remember to check studentofthegun.com daily for new free content and giveaways. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. Are you a social butterfly connect with us on instagram facebook and twitter for new content each and every day at student of the gun watch student of the gun tv and videos from our trusted partners on roku apple tv amazon fire tv chromecast and even airplay go to studentofthegun.com for direct links and remember you're a beginner once a student for life